Hello to my brothers and sisters who are viewing by way of Facebook and YouTube. Once again, we are so very privileged and thankful to have another opportunity to be here at the Freeman Heights Baptist Church in the great city of Garland, Texas, as we continue to explore and dive into the Word of God. We would ask that you would join us with your Bible or device and turn to Matthew, the second chapter, the 11th verse. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. You may have a different version, but it's the same spirit-filled, holy word of God. Matthew 2 and 11. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And all of God's children said amen to the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful and thankful for the privilege that you've given us. We thank you for this morning's rising up and last night's laying down. We ask that you would take this, your servant, and hide me by the cross. Use me to your glory. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. For those who need a subject, I'm going to be talking just for a few minutes about what to give Jesus for Christmas. What to give Jesus for Christmas. We've just had Black Friday. We've had Cyber Monday. And let me just make up another one. Make up one Wednesday. All of these days are designed to get you to spend money to buy gifts that most people don't need. But when you do decide to give, isn't it one of the issues that you come up with is, what do I give my father? What do I give my mother? What do I give my wife? What do I give my children? Looking for something that they might need, you, it's a question that's pondered every time is, what do I give these gifts to these people that I care for? And, and some make it real difficult because there are many who have so much it's difficult to identify what they might need. As we assemble here today, less than two weeks from Christmas during this Advent season, the bigger issue, my brothers and sisters, that I would bring before you is, what do you give to someone that owns it all? Yes, what to give Jesus for Christmas. In our text today, we see these magi, these wise men, these, these astrologers, they figured it out. And what did they figure out? <clears throat> Let's review the gifts that they gave, the gifts that Jesus Christ received. First, they said, the, the text says they gave gold. Gold was one of the gifts. Gold being symbolic of royalty or kingship. In emphasizing the fact that Jesus is majestic and he is king. The other gift that they provided was frankincense. Frankincense is a symbol of deity. It was part of the special incense that was burned on the altar within the holy place and the smoke penetrated into God's presence in the holies of holies itself. Thus, frankincense emphasizes Jesus is king of king. Jesus is God. The next gift that they provided him was myrrh, myrrh. And myrrh was a symbol of death. It was used in the Old Testament and new for embalming. It, uh, John 19 records the story after Jesus Christ had died and uh, Nicodemus came before him and asked for his body. And who, or excuse me, Joseph of Arimathea came before him asking for his body, and it was Nicodemus, it was Nicodemus who came with myrrh and alloys, the Bible tells us, myrrh and alloys, to wrap the linens that would be used for the burial of Jesus. They all three gave very valuable gifts, but they were all different. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There is a gift that all of us can give regardless of our stature, whether we're rich or whether we're poor, whether we have uh, 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 six digits behind our name or a high school diploma, whether we live in a fancy car or drive a hoopty, 
Whether we live in a mansion or live in a very humble home, there's one gift that all of us can give. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white or brown or yellow. There's one gift that we all can give Jesus during this season as we approach the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All can, in fact, worship him, worship Jesus Christ. The Magi, or these wise men, provide us a template. They give us a guidance. They give us some guidelines on how we should worship because the Bible says worship in spirit and in what? Truth. So this is just a template that they give us in one power-packed verse. The first recorded worshipers were poor Jewish shepherds, and now we see rich Gentile wise men giving us and showing to us the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, that his life purpose was to be savior for Jews and Gentiles. In this power pack verse, we see a pattern that we can follow. What do we know about the Magi? What do we know about these wise men? We know that they were from the East. We cannot be sure where the East is located because the Bible simply says East. Different theologians and commentaries, commentators would uh, give their uh, belief of where it is, but we'll just stick with the scripture and just identify that they came from the east. And we also need to understand that when they came, and that there were, some people say three, but the Bible does not tell us three. There were three gifts, but that does not necessarily mean three uh, were the number of wise men. So to be very conservative, it would be best to conclude that we know they were wealthy, we know they came from the east, and we know they came bearing very valuable gifts. The other thing that, uh, that they bring about this, this worship, this template, is they were very intentional about their worship. They were very intentional about your worship. You might be asking the question, where did I get that from the text? Well, in reading the whole second chapter of Matthew, we go to the beginning of that chapter, we find these words. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, where is he that has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Matthew, the second chapter, one, two, tells us in those first two verses that they, they had a intent. They, they had their minds made up that they were going to worship him. You know, we used to sing that one in church. I, I woke up with my mind stayed on Jesus Christ. They were intentional in their worship. And intentional worship is ever-present hunger to honor God in our hearts and with our lives. It is seeking with purpose and intent, wisdom that we should live a life that's pleasing in his sight. The theologian William Barclay declared, our God-given spirit is the highest, most noble part of us, the source of our greatest dreams and desires. True worship, according to Barclay, comes when our spirit seeks the highest, a personal, proper relationship with the eternal and holy God. Intentional worship is the reason that Paul was able, him and Silas, in the midst of of being confined in a jailhouse in the midnight hour they were able to sing praises to the to God why because they had their minds made up to be intentional about their worship intentional worship is the reason that a woman whose life was shattered and filled by sin anointed the feet of Jesus with her most expensive perfume it was intentional worship is the reason that a poor, destitute woman unselfishly dropped her last penny into the offering plate. Intentional worship is the reason that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was facing death on the cross, that he cried out and said, not my will, but your will be done. All oh, intentional worship, people with their mind made up that they would worship the Lord. Do you have your mind made up? Or do you have your eyes stayed on Jesus? Not only were they intentional in their worship, but they gave us a great another great principle about worship. 
The Bible says they saw him. They acknowledged his deity without seeing his miracles. When the, when the Magi came in, they saw him and they worshipped him. They saw him and worshipped him. And most commentators and most theologians would agree Jesus was not a baby. He was probably, uh, he was under two years old. So uh, we understand that he had not performed a lot of miracles that are recorded in the gospel, but yet they worshipped him. They worshipped him before he turned water into wine. They worshipped him before he opened up blinded eyes. Oh, they worshipped him before he was casting out demons. They worshipped him before he fed 5,000 with just a few loaves of bread and two fish. They worshipped him before he raised the widow Nain's, Nain's son from the grave, from a funeral procession. Oh, yes, before all of those things occurred, these three kings who are the excuse, these magi, these kings, these wise men, they were worshiping him as the savior of the world. And notice their posture. Not only were they intentional, but they humbled themselves. They fell down and worshiped him. Oh, we should be humble during this season and recognizing that it's all about Jesus Christ and not ourselves. Luke 8, 40, 41 records the uh, story of Jairus, a leader of the synagogue who falls at the feet of Jesus. His only daughter was 12 years old, was dying. He falls at the feet of Jesus, recognizing that Jesus was something special, that Jesus was someone that was, should be humbled and fell at his feet. Have you fell at the feet of Jesus and adored him? Have you fell at your feet and recognized that he is, in fact, the King of kings and Lord of lords? The two Marys fell at his feet of Jesus when they saw him after seeing the resurrection. They saw him. They humbled themselves. They fell down at his feet. We, should, we too, should fall down at his feet. And then, my brothers and sisters, we need to recognize the fact that they gave of themselves. They gave themselves. It's right there in our text. I shared with you earlier, no one was sure exactly where in the east the three magi came from. But here's one thing we do know. Even from the most conservative uh, commentators and theologians, it took them at least three to six weeks in travel time, most conservative, to get to see Jesus. They got to see Jesus. They gave of their time. Yes, my brothers and sisters, all of us can give some time in support and worship of our great God. Have you looked at your calendar recently? How much of your time has been dedicated to worshiping the Lord? How much of your time have you spent in doing the work of the Lord? Oh yeah, my brothers and sisters, if we look at a calendar, it can tell us some things about who and what we truly worship. We should have time dedicated to spend worshiping the Lord, time spent in Bible reading, prayer and study, and time spent in serving him. So not only did they give their time, but my brothers and sisters, they gave their resources. They gave what they had that was of value, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You might be asking yourself the question today, well, I don't have a lot of means. I don't have gold. I don't have frankincense. I don't have myrrh. But what you do have, you can give to the support of the ministry to bring glory and honor to God because he does, in fact, own it all. And one of the things that I'm so excited about is during this season, Freeman Heights Baptist Church, we are trying to do our very best by pouring out gifts to those that are less fortunate than we are to impact our community, not so that we would be lifted up. Oh, no, my brothers and sisters, not so that Freeman Heights Baptist Church would be lifted up. No, no, my brothers and sisters, but because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that he would be lifted up because the scripture says that if we lift him up, he'll draw all men unto him. During this Advent season and during Christmas, we ought to have our minds made up that we want to do 
those things that would draw men to Jesus Christ by our lifestyle and our worship. And first and foremost, the gift is to give yourself to Christ as your Savior. If you're watching this YouTube, if you're watching this video, and you're not certain or sure that you would go to heaven if you were to die, I came by to tell you that Jesus Christ was born. He lived a life that was sinless so that he could pay the price for those who sinned. He died on a cross so that we could live. And he got up on Easter Sunday morning, resurrected with all power in his hands, demonstrating that he had defeated death. And so if you trust him with your life, you too can have the assurance that when you take your last breath, you've got a home prepared for you in heaven that you can spend eternity with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, worshiping him. And if you've already made that most important decision, oh, we pray that you would give yourself in true worship. Give your time, resources, your intentional heart to him. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful for this privilege that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity. We thank you and pray that right now your spirit would move in hearts and minds, no matter where they are, that decisions would be made that would be pleasing in your sight. So in the precious name of Jesus we pray, amen. God bless you and keep you during this Advent season and have a great, great Merry Christmas.